Following World War I, uh, the Holy Land was gobbled up uh, by the British Empire. Um, and it was a land containing both Jewish and Arab populations by the end of World War I. Uh, the victorious allies in the, in the war, France and Britain, had um, decided uh, secretly that they were going to carve up the Ottoman Empire. All that's left today out of that great empire is just the country of Turkey. So most of the Middle East was assigned um, uh, to the British uh, and a little bit of it to the French, but uh, Great Britain had figured out the importance of oil by the end of World War I. And so the lands that they claimed um, were designed in such a way that they could get oil out two different ways. One to the Persian Gulf and the other right straight across with a pipeline from Iraq all the way over to the Mediterranean. Um, and in order to legally justify what they were doing, because they were the winners, and the winners get to write history, and the winners get to legally justify what they do, um, the British went to the League of Nations. In 1917, um, the issue was declared to the world that once the war was going to be over, that Britain would then um, be able to divide up the lands in the area and they were going to make a national home for the Jewish people. Um, this was called the Balfour Declaration. And the Balfour Declaration was named after Sir Arthur Balfour, who was only the foreign secretary of Britain at the time, but he had been the prime minister. And um, the prime minister, though, during the war was another man who had the same idea, and they worked hand in hand, and his name was David Lloyd George. Sir Arthur Balfour, as you can see on the slide, there's a cartoon of him, and it shows him sitting down, almost reclining with his uh, legs um, crossed. And this was naturally how he sat all the time. He was a very tall man. And even when he was sitting in Parliament, people would look at him and say, he looks like he's lazy, looks like he's sitting there and he's asleep. But that was his uh, approach to, to life. He was kicked back, but he was really a, a genius of a person. And um, he was raised um, with, a, or he was born really with a silver spoon in his mouth. Many of his uncles had been the prime ministers. He came from a very aristocratic family, but the unusual thing about that family was his mother really believed that the Bible was God's word, and she raised him that way. And that was very unusual for that class of people in those years, but Balfour, all of his life, always had open Bibles all around his home, and um, he really relied on the scriptures, and it was one of those reasons that when the time came, he thought, maybe I can somehow be of service in bringing the Jews back to the land because he always believed that God had promised that, is, that the people of Israel were going to return to the land of Israel. Lord Rothschild was the Baron Rothschild of the famous Jewish Rothschild family. And he was probably the richest man um, in all of England in those days. And the Balfour Declaration, when you read it carefully, was actually addressed to Lord Rothschild. And that's why I was so happy to finally find a picture of him. Heim Weissman was also a very unusual character. Heim Weissman came from the swamps in Poland, as far in the backwoods as you could get, and um, where you would expect that he would have received very little education. But he made his way into Europe, where he earned a PhD in chemistry. Heim Weissman eventually went to England and was teaching uh, chemistry there. And um, when Theodore Herzl died, who was the father of Zionism, Heim Weizmann um, attempted to step into his place and be the head of the Zionist movement. And Heim Weizmann and 
Sir Arthur Balfour um, had a couple of conversations and you couldn't have found uh, two more different men from such different backgrounds. One from the absolute backwoods of Poland and the other from the upper echelon of the great British Empire. But they liked each other and they hit it off and Heim Weizmann talked to Sir Arthur Balfour about the vision of the Zionist movement that someday the Jews were going to have to go back uh, to the land that God had promised them. The third character in all of this is David Lloyd George. And David Lloyd George was the prime minister in 1917 when the Balfour Declaration was issued. David Lloyd George in politics and in life was as different from Arthur Balfour as you could imagine. David Lloyd George came from a very, very poor family and um, his mother and father were both from Wales, but they were living in England and his father died when he was a very young boy. His mother, out of necessity, had to move back to Wales and live um, with her uh, parents. And so um, David, in many ways, was raised by his grandfather. And his grandfather was one of those odd, wad kind of people in those days. He didn't believe that the Church of England um, was the proper way to worship. And so he was one of these people who said, no, I think we should only worship uh, and study using the Bible and not all the books of prayer and everything else. So he was really kind of an outsider. But he would have little David there at that uh, kitchen table in that small little cottage down in Wales. And as a child, he'd say, Davy, listen, God's word says that someday the children of Israel are going to return to their land. And it was perhaps 65 years later when David Lloyd George suddenly had become prime minister that it settled into his mind and heart that maybe he could also be helpful in bringing the Jews back. And when he and Balfour formed a government during World War I, this was one thing that was on both of their hearts, and they finally pushed through this Balfour uh, Declaration. There were many reasons as people look back as to why did England do this? Why did they want to build a homeland for the Jewish people. It certainly couldn't have been for biblical reasons. Well, a lot of other uh, political and um, military reasons came uh, to view over the years. And one of those is um, on this slide um, that shows three arrows. And one of the arrows points toward the Suez Canal. One of the geopolitical reasons was that Britain, if they could get Palestine, they could protect the Suez Canal because the Suez Canal was the lifeline that they were relying on to bring in goods from the uh, crown colony that they had. And that crown jewel colony in the great British Empire was called India. And it was a much shorter and a much safer trip to come through the Suez Canal and through the Mediterranean um, to the Isle of England than it was to have to go all the way around Africa. So to secure the Suez Canal, the British wanted to control both sides of it. So following World War I, they were not only in Egypt, but then they wanted um, what they were calling Palestine uh, because that covered uh, both the north and the south of the Suez Canal. Another reason um, is identified by these other arrows was that they wanted to block Russia from moving down into the Mediterranean. And so if they could get a foothold there in the, in the, Medi in, in the eastern end of the Mediterranean, they could keep Russia out. And the third empire they wanted to block was France. And so um, they were kind of worked out a deal with France, but it was blocking France from getting in uh, to the Middle East. And, and that's one of the uh, unusual things. You say, why is it called the Middle East? If you talk to somebody and say, well, you're a Middle Easterner, Middle East makes no sense. 
only if you view it from the British standpoint. If you're in England and you're looking um, to the east toward India, midway to India is the Suez Canal. And so that region around the Suez Canal looking east midway to it to the goal of going to India is the Middle East and that's why it only makes sense from a British standpoint to talk about uh, the Middle East. Many of the men involved who it seems that God was touching their hearts individually at a particular time in history and, um, and it all came to a head there in November of 1917. But the hidden and the underlying fact remains that many of these British officials as children had been taught that the Bible really was the Word of God and that God had promised over and over again that someday the Jews who were the chosen people would be restored to their promised land. It was this spiritual belief planted as a seed in childhood that awakened and sprouted in their later lives when they had attain, attained leadership roles in the greatest empire in the history of the world. In 1919, Balfour wrote a defense of the Declaration and the Zionist movement. And I believe it is enlightening to read a paragraph in the language of that wonderful man, Sir Arthur Balfour. And he said this, the position of the Jews is unique. For them, race, religion, and country are interrelated. As they are, are interrelated in the case of no other race, no other religion, and no other country on earth. In no other case are the believers in one of the greatest religions of the world to be found only among the members of a single small people. In the case of no other religion, is its past development so intimately bound up with the long political history of a petty territory wedged in between states more powerful far than it could ever be. In the case of no other religion are its aspirations and hopes expressed in language and imagery so utterly dependent for their meaning on the conviction that only from this one land, only through this one history, only by this one people is full religious knowledge to be spread through all the world. I'm quite sure that the words of the prophet Isaiah must have touched the heart of Belfort as he read and meditated on the 49th chapter of Isaiah in the verses 5 and 6 and he says and now the Lord says he who formed me in the womb to be his servant to bring Jacob back to him and gather Israel to himself he says it is too small a thing for you to be my servant to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I have kept I will also make you a light for the Gentiles that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. This is a quick look at one incident in history that occurred in November of 1917 that set the pattern, that opened the gates, uh, that enticed the Jews that worked right alongside God in his plan to bring the Jews back to the land that is called Israel. And that's the story of the Balfour Declaration.